Professor Mingshan, how do you see the Portuguese foreign policy towards Asia? China market, the growth of Southeast Asia, but above all, the unique Portuguese historical and cultural linkage with Macau should yield the anchorage for Portugal to have a very beneficial and economically rewarding outreach with that part of Asia. How, how should you, for example, uh, explain to, to a Portuguese politician about the importance of Asia to Portugal? Portugal is a member of the EU, which has very extensive and fruitful exchange with China mainland, but also with what I call the offshore Chinese societies of Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Macau. And they maintain extremely high and steady growth in the last decade and a half, while EU and particularly Eurozone, of which Portugal is tied to, is not doing too well. And so there have been suggestions for Chinese mainland, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Macau, economic exchange, particularly in the form of trade and investment, very large scale investment, including the buying of Portuguese public bonds denominated in Euro by the extremely large reserve funds. If you put mainland China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Macau together, it is perhaps two or three times bigger than most of the debts of any EU country. So in some sense, China could be a very supportive, friendly economic partner whose active engagement with Portugal or for that matter other EU countries would in the immediate term of two to three years help to uplift what had been a rather unfortunate and depressed economy of Portugal and of much of its southern neighbor like Spain and Italy. And among so many great powers in the world, uh, why should China pay, need to pay attention to a country like Portugal, for example? As a matter of fact, China's modern historical engagement with the West, the West of modern science technology, of international outreach, of empires and now commonwealths, and above all of Christianity, Western concept law, all start 500 years ago when the Portuguese reached the southern coast of China and set up a foothold of enclave in the city of Macau. Although Macau was returned to Chinese rule right before Christmas 1999, Macau had very much in when itself, reinvent itself as the hub, as the platform, as the bridging mechanism for Chinese outreach, economic, strategic culture. With the Lusophone country, particularly through Portugal, with the big superstar called Brazil, which like China is part of the five developing major economies, the BRICS, but also the other African member of this Lusophone community, Angola, had been a very important trade partner with China, probably the most important African country in terms of energy and other resources. The supply, the Chinese needs, while Chinese goods and investment have been of influence in the modernization of Angola. So you put in also the other dimensions of the Lusophone block, right in the Asia theater you had East Timor, and not too far from the Indian Ocean you had the Mozambique. So in some sense, this Lusophone block of eight countries constitute China's outreach to both the developed country, Portugal, member of EU, member of NATO, but to Brazil, the rising star of the Americas, 
and Angola, Mozambique, which are strategically on both sides of the African continent, one on the Atlantic shore and one on the Indian Ocean shore. So for this outreach and global embrace, China could find no easier and better partner than Portugal with its really important and most of all friendly heritage city called Macau. So how, how does the Chinese politicians sees Portugal, for example. What I Portugal means for them? I think Portugal had several meanings. Portugal is a member of the EU. As a matter of fact, the current EU Commission President, Mr. Barroso, was the Prime Minister of Portugal. So China never would look down, despite Portugal's limited size and population, of Portugal's importance in European affairs. But above all, China is really well aware of the Lusophone connections. Once you have Lisbon, you have good connections to the other capitals of the Lusophone group. Brazil, Angola, Mozambique, and East Timor, and so on and so forth. So it is a case of five continent minus one. Europe, where this one is, East Timor, Asia. Angola, Mozambique, Guinea, Basu, and all that. Africa, coast of Africa. And Brazil, the superstar of America. Four major continents that could not be a more systematic network through the Dusel Form connection. And I understand right in Lisbon, you have the headquarters for this Dusel Form, the country, the CPLP organization, which is very active, and the Chinese leadership had very productive relationship with most of this CPLP member countries. And as a matter of fact, the Chinese state president and the premier have visited most of these Lusophone countries. And two years ago, when Macau celebrated its very important 10th anniversary of the resolution to Chinese rule, President Hu Jintao from Beijing talked about Macau should help to develop its function, its cultural advantage, to serve as the hub for the training of Lusophone technicians, educators, administrators, on behalf of what they now call the Sino-Luso Cooperation Forum. And then last year, Premier Wen Jiabao came down to perform the most important opening keynote address at this ministerial meeting of the sino lusophone Cooperation Forum. So you could see China is not just talking, but committing lots of human, political, economic, and technical resources to make the network a real one, a functioning one, a productive one to work, what they call win-win-win situation. So if we could simplify, it is what I call a three-step formula. You start from China, link up to Portugal, and from Portugal you link up to the Lusophone countries, and the Lusophone countries are of strategic importance in all the four continents. So you have the sino hyphen luso hyphen global network. And this is a very productive, cooperative networking for economic advancement, but it's above all a mutual one. It's not China win, but Portugal win, the Lusophone country win, and people in their neighborhoods 
also would win, so it's a win-win-win-win situation. And there's no reason the people here in Portugal in this country not to make full use. After all, Portugal for historical reason, despite its limited size, is still the premier country in this useful plot. So uh, you are saying that the Chinese politicians uh, are looking at Portugal as also a global player. So a part, a part of uh, a global yeah. players. And China is cherished friendly partner because the Chinese leadership had long historical memories. They are really appreciative of the fact, yes, Macau was under Portuguese rule for 500 years, was the first foreign power to have a settlement on Chinese soil and was the last one to exit this special relationship. But there's no ill feeling. As a matter of fact, the Chinese government and the Portuguese government had worked very really well as friends and partners in the decade and a half from Macau's determination to be returned to Chinese rule to its actual handover in December 1999. Both sides had maintained friendly relationship, unlike the case of Hong Kong, where the British had a very difficult and unfriendly relationship with Beijing until really the ending moment of the British sunset colonial regime in 1999, the Macau case was a superb contrast of what did not go wrong, what did go smoothly. So China is quite willing to reward, if we may say so, the historical friendship and the cooperation in the Macau affair so the end of Macau under Portuguese rule actually is the beginning of a new chapter of Macau as a joint product of the Chinese and Portuguese culture, influence and geography. And now this joint product is to be a bridging agent, the functioning hub, the platform for a very full-scale sino luso phone country cooperation with Portugal as a very important, perhaps the foremost partner with Beijing. And it's through Portugal, Beijing hope to reach in the Rio, San Paulo, Brasilia, and Luanda, and Dakli in East Timor. So it is up to the leadership and the informed public in Portugal and in the Lusophone countries to make use of this historical opportunity based on the goodwill that was preserved in Macau during the 500 years no war. Unlike the British, they fought the Opium War twice to gain control of the domain colony of Hong Kong. Portugal never went to war against China and the Chinese appreciate that. There is only historical friendship and there was not much one could talk about historical hostility. Professor Mingchen, so you are saying that uh, from the Chinese point of view, the relations among, between China and Western powers, so like the, the relations with Germany or with the British or French, so the, the relation with Portugal is different. Do you agree that? Portugal was always treated in a separate category by the Chinese regime and even the people as far back as the three or four century. The Ming Dynasty in the 1500s trusted the Portuguese missionary particularly those related to the Jesuit order, to help revive the lunar calendar, to prepare them with modern Western style Portuguese firearms, cannons in coastal defense. And the Chinese appreciate the Portuguese advancement in astrology and navigational systems. After all, China also had been a sailing 
power, but it turned inward when the Manchu, the Qing dynasty took over. But later on, from the Opium War until the Second World War, China was subject to one kind or another of Western, British, French, German, Eastern, Russian, and Japanese imperialism. But other than the tiny little enclave, which is more a settlement rather than a real colony, that the port is established on the fringe of South China's Guangdong coast, in that little city of Macau, Portugal never had a single colony, unlike the British, the French, the Germans, the Russian, on mainland China. So in some sense, Portugal was relatively clear in the so-called chronology of imperialism, colonialism against China's national interests. And also, in the case of Macau, while the Portuguese was of course a Catholic nation, it did not monopolize religion, but rather allowed the Chinese, whether they practice folk Buddhism or Taoism, you had the parallel Catholic church with its buildings and the Chinese temples with its monasteries and all that existing in Macau. And the Portuguese did not enforce what they call language policy. That's why when they feel Macau born Chinese really could amend with high proficiency. Oh, Professor Mingxian, in, for instance, you are a counselor for the Portuguese government. So what would you advise then, uh, linking Portugal and Asia to be more proactive, to search for opportunities that have been on the agenda of this Chinese government promoted Sino-Russo network of cooperation, but there are other Asian countries, like India, who is on the upswing, and there are Southeast Asian countries that have long appreciate their so-called Luso historical roots. So those are artists that you would use to build the Portuguese next generation need not be divorced from Europe, need not be negative on EU integration, but must at the same time maintain a very healthy cooperative relationship with the cricket. So China. currently we are <coughs> celebrating the 500 years of the arrival of the Portuguese people to Southeast Asia and Asia Pacific. Do you think that it's time again to, to uh, return? The era of economic underlining, but also of social, cultural, educational, technological collaboration what we would often refer to as the soft power. So the old empire of sailing ships, of cannons, of actual conquest, they have long been over. But the new era of soft power is changed. Soft power, democratic values, soft power, educational, cultural, linkages. Those are areas that Portugal should more actively adopt for its engagement with the rest of the world, particularly with East Asia, which is a major growth area. The only growth area of any size and magnitude in 